On this episode, a Philadelphia institution that's part medical museum and part cabinet of curiosities. They are conjoined twins. They married sisters and they had 21 children. I, you I'm can't not move ready on. to move You'll on. You'll realize you're in a fetal position. Where the quirks of life give new insight to the wonders of creation. That's a big golem. Oh, early, 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 super early here in Philadelphia. I do love the cobblestone streets still in Philadelphia. So rustic and historic. It's fun with the coffee. Yeah. Jeez. We're here today because a viewer named Ricky went onto my Facebook page and told me about a strange museum called the Mooter that her husband Bruce was too squeamish to visit. Since she didn't get to go, she asked me to go in her place. And since I am a curious person by nature, I said, sure. Our somebody in question is a woman named Anna Doty. Now, you know what I know. Hi, Anna. How are you? Good to meet you. It's lovely to meet you. Curator or curator? What do you like? Well, I think curator is what most people expect to hear. I think so. But there's something vaguely national treasure-ish and, and continental about Continental, the, European, About, about yes. the curator, you know? Curator, yeah. Well, just in case it doesn't come out, just tell them now. For the record, this is Anna's mission. Tell them. I am the historical record keeper of the human body in all of its glory, Wonder. its suffering, its pain, and its splendor. Yeah, the that's that, really great. Yeah. We're part of a much larger institution. It's called the College of Physicians of Philadelphia. Yes. It is the oldest professional society in continuous operation in the United States. It was started in 1787. It's college as in colleague. It's not a degree-granting institution mm -hmm. where all the doctors from all the different hospitals and universities could meet to share ideas and techniques and camaraderie. So the first thing I want to show you is Dr. Mooter himself because yes. we can't talk about the Mooter Museum without talking about Dr. Mooter. So this is the handsome gentleman here with mutton chops. Uh -huh. Dr. Mooter added the umlaut. I think he wanted to sound a little bit more continental, so he went from mutter, mutter. to mooter. Uh, well, why him? Dr. Mooter, this is around 1858, um, he was a fellow here, unfortunately found himself in ill health at a fairly young age and decided to bequeath to the college his entire teaching collection, as well as a substantial endowment. Yeah. And so when we walk around here, sometimes you'll see specimens that'll say um, old mooter number or original mooter number, and those will be his, some of his original donations. You know, he was really all about teaching, and that's what we're all about here, is, is teaching. Our mission has always been education. Most of the people who come in here have no medical background whatsoever. I got it. Well, how about if we hit Einstein's brain? I mean, not literally hit Einstein, but we go to Einstein's brain, and then we can go around to the hurdle skulls. Hmm. This is one of only two places in the world where you will see parts of Einstein's brain. Now, I say parts because it's the slides. Sure. And his brain was taken without his family's permission and certainly without his permission. Well, he was no longer using it, right? He had actually said prior to his death that he did not want to be uh, preserved, any part of him to be preserved. He didn't actually even want his body to be buried. I believe he was cremated. The uh, pathologist took it upon himself to remove Einstein's brain at autopsy and kept it in a pickle jar, in a cider box, in his closet for a couple decades. What, what can we learn? He died at around 76, I believe, but he did not have that plaque buildup that a lot of us get in our brain as we get older. He had the brain of a young man. Anna knows a lot about brains and bones and whatever this is, but I'm interested in the world's most famous twins. Would you like to know the reason why the term Siamese twins existed? I would. Is that Chang and Ang a bunker? Absolutely. Like those guys. I know those guys. Chang and Ang bunker. Now. They are kind of billed as the world's first Siamese twins because they are born in Siam. We use the politically correct term conjoined twins now, and we know that there have been records of conjoined twins going on from, since recorded history. They toured with a lot of different sideshows and circuses. They were very, very popular, but they did eventually retire from this profession. They bought adjoining farms in Manoray, North Carolina. Conjoining farms? <laughs> Conjoining farms. Uh, they spent a couple days at one brother's house, a couple days at the other brother's house, and whosoever house they were at, that's who was boss. Chang liked his alcoholic beverages, okay? This one? Aang Ang was a teetotaler, but Aang liked to stay up late at night playing poker. So that's why they had this situation to accommodate each other's needs. They were born conjoined and they died conjoined. But what's interesting to note is that at the time of the autopsy, they found that they had conjoined livers, and that's the livers right here. Ah, that's where I knew it. Yep. Had they tried to get separated in life, it would not have been successful. 
because they would have died. The you, liver is highly vascular. You can't mess with the liver, right? You know, you can die just f from exsanguination, from blood loss. And, and keep in mind, this is like late 1800s. Yeah. They would have died. I, I'm not ready on. to move you on. You realize you're in a fetal position right now. I am. You, I'm, you are, I'm a ball You are curled up on the floor horror. of the Mütter Museum. This is, my work here is done. Peace out. You're, you're so weird. Show me something Thank else. Thank you. All right. A drawer full of things taken out of people's throats. <laughs> We're talking over 2,000 objects. Every single object you're seeing here was taken out of somebody's throat by one man. His name was Dr. Chevalier Jackson. This is just drawer after drawer, drawer stuff? Drawer after drawer. Was he like the go-to? I mean, is this all he did? Yeah, this is pretty much all he did. Safety pins, he liked to call danger pins. These guys yeah. must be kids. Let's just say some of them were accidentally ingested and some were forcibly ingested. Oh, God, there's some, there's some stories of a sadistic nanny doing this to a young child. It's just That was one of the things that upset me when I, when I read about that. I'm sensing that Anna is more than just the curator. She's a walking encyclopedia. What's your business card say? Well, I mean, I'm the curator of the Moon Museum, but I'm yeah. also a, a trained forensic anthropologist. So I look at, I focus mainly on, mainly on human bones. That's what I like. So when you watch shows like Bones, for instance, does it fill you with pride for your industry or does it make you want to run screaming? Let's go with the run screaming. Well, I mean, it makes me jealous. I mean, if I had a lab like that, I mean, I could do some good stuff. It's cool that they're bringing, making forensic anthropology. Cool, I mean. And you can wear stilettos and whatnot. Oh, yeah, sure. <laughs> She can wear still. Do not. All right. Thank you. <laughs> you want to go see the soap lady? I would love to go see the soap lady. All right, let's go. This is a real human body. She is called a saponified body. That's a process where the body fats actually uh, turn chemically into this kind of waxy, tallowy, soapy-like substance, and that's why we call her the soap lady. It's kind of horrifying. Okay, yeah, that's another thing we like to talk about is that she's not screaming. Yes, no. she is. No, she's no, not. Look at her. She's... So when you decompose your mandible and your maxilla, they're only held together by a little bit of flesh. Those de decompose really quickly, and what's the first thing that happens? Gravity. Gravity. It's a lot of fancy talk, and it's impressive, <laughs> but I'm telling you, she was screaming. She's not screaming! So the guy who uh, procured her, he discovered these bodies. There was a soap man and a soap woman. So uh, the soap lady here is ours, and the soap man is at the Smithsonian. She get them together. You got a got soap guy, place. we got a soap girl. They could get together, have some of those little tiny, tiny. bars of soap you see in the hotel rooms. It'd be awesome. We, 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 You'd we, clean up. We have soap lady on a rope in the gift store. <laughs> Do you really? Yes. You have soap on a rope in the gift store? Soap lady on a rope. Is this the gift store? This is the museum store, yeah. Oh, this is awesome. Soap lady on a rope. Now this is dirt scented, and uh, there's only one place you can get a plushy mega colon. You do a lot of traveling, right? This makes a good neck pillow, can I? May I? You have to have a sense of humor. Yeah, I mean, if you, if you worked here all day, every day, surrounded by death, surrounded by the macabre, you need to have a giant stem cell to just cuddle at night. Is that what this is? That's a giant stem cell. Well, like my granddad said, if you're not laughing, the joke's on you. <laughs> All right, so I think this door is open. We're in the commercial break now. We can go anywhere we want. All right. This is a woman with a horn growing out of her face. Right. Except it's not a horn. It's a corneal cutaneum. That is a hypergrowth of skin in a different... Like a rhino horn isn't really a horn. <laughs> She's already had... Okay, when you... You know how some people are prone to getting freckles? And some people are sure. prone to getting horns. Who? Smile and nod. Who's prone to getting horns? People who have a lot of exposure to the sun because the UV of the sun can actually stimulate that. That's why the most of the horns that we see, especially today, are on the face and on the arms because that's where you get the most sun exposure. What do you mean the most of the horns we see today? Who yes. has a horn today? Lots of people still get the horn. The point is they're, t they're removed before they get to those epic proportions. Yes. I missed this. Yes. I missed the whole headline. Well, this is horrifying news. Yeah. Lots of people spend time in the sun. They need to know about the dangers of horns. Hello, I'm Mike Rowe. And I'm Anna Doty. And we're here today to talk about a problem you may be familiar with. A problem with consequences, however, that may shock you. Too much sun exposure can give you a horn. You heard her right. Too much exposure in the sun can give you not just a tan, not just a melanoma, but a horn. So wear that SPF. Lather it on. A nice hat will always help. Right. Or roll the dice. Enjoy a nice bronze glow. 
and then wake up one morning, just say no to horns. It's, it's time to clean the mega clone. All right, I need the uh, makeup brush and the uh, gloves. And gloves. Mega colon. Visiting the Mütter Museum was a brilliant idea given to us by our Facebook friend, Ricky. Ricky didn't actually see this place for herself when she was in Philadelphia since her husband, Bruce, wasn't interested. It would be rude not to say thanks. Hello. Ricky. This is my husband, Bruce. Bruce, Mike. how are you? How are you doing? Doing fine. They told me, Bruce, that you uh, didn't let Ricky come into the museum. What's up? What do you mean, didn't let her? What, that like, she has to get my permission? <laughs> <laughs> we were on a trip. We need to go together. Thanks again for the suggestion. We really appreciate it, all right? Okay, well, I'm so glad you took it and enjoyed it. See you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. What nice people. What I'd like you to do here is dust the world's <laughs> largest human colon. <laughs> That's a big colon. Now, it's eight feet, four inches long. It's oh, a foot and a half on. at the widest diameter. And at the time of death, it had 40 pounds of fecal material in it. It does not have fecal material in it anymore. Come on, how can this occupy a human body? How Just like it... this, right here. Oh, that's the guy? That's the guy. Oh, dear. Yeah, it kind of looks like in his, in his fifth trimester. All the nostalgia, all of the vert schmaltz and sentiment wrapped up in the good old days, right? I get it, but. But. Modern uh, medicine, but. all right? The good old, this is part of the good old days. Yeah. A colon the size of a mermaid. This is very, very delicate. This is, the, the intestine's very thin tissue. This has been dried out. You can see it's, it's breaking apart. So this is a makeup brush. Mm -hmm. Just very carefully, just try and just get a little of the dust off. Be very, very gentle. Yeah. yeah you wanna get into those nooks and crannies. Mm -hmm. You can see the dust coming off. Very nice. This is a very dusty colon. Yeah. That'd be a good name for a band. Ladies and gentlemen, put your hands together all the way from the bowels of Baltimore. There you go. It's the Dusty Colon. No buts about it. Oh, oh, you cracked me up. The colon was vast, but at least it was dry. This is our wet specimen room. Of course it is. Of course. Every single wet specimen that's not on display is in this room because they need to be kept at a very strict temperature. One of the perks of being a big time TV guy is getting special access. Hey, it's brains. To fabulous places like the Wet Specimen Lab at the Mütter Museum. Stomach? If you're into stuff like this. Enlarged prostate. Or if you like the smell of formaldehyde. We. You. Which it turns out is not what you want to preserve your organs in. As I'm finding out from George, who runs this weird wet world. We learned over a period of time formaldehyde breaks down. So our goal here is to take everything that we know is in formaldehyde and try to get it into an alcohol-based solution. Pretty simple, really. Pour out the old, careful to catch the specimen, then pour in the new, and be thankful you can't smell what I smell. And then you just plop it on. Push? Yeah, just push down on it so you can get a seal all the way around. I think I got it. You got it? Good. Now it's on to the bone room to see some human skulls. Tova's here and she's going to escort you into the bone room. Tova has the job of trying to keep a giant collection of human skulls in peak condition. These are all, uh, these are human skulls? Yes. These are all human skulls, yes. <laughs> Which one are we going to uh, handle? The third one in on the bottom. Third one on the bottom? Very carefully. Our goal is to what, clean it? Part of it. What part? The nose. Okay, very carefully. Mm -hmm. You can lift the mandible off and put it over there. Right side up. Spray this water into the nasal cavity. Like down in here? Yeah, gently. Okay, well, I think this will conclude our little segment here. This was fun, Tova. Are you impressed? Did I do anything right, anything wrong? You did some things right. <laughs> Tova, a pleasure. It's nice to meet you. It's nice to meet you. You want to shake? Sure. <laughs> See you on TV. <laughs> Awkward. I really thought I could push and leave here, but I can't. I have to pull it. See, this is why exits are so awful.
If you've been watching Anna and saying to yourself, wow, she could have her own show, you're right, sort of. Hi, and welcome back to another episode of Guess What's on the Curator's Desk. Every week, Anna shows her faithful following something from the collection and asks them to do their best to identify what it is or what it does. For example, on this one, if you guessed a jar of skin, you win. Now I have the great honor of making a guest appearance on Anna's show. Three, two, one. Now this mystery object is a diagnostic tool. But other than that, I'm not going to give you too many hints. Mike, can you figure out what this is? Yes. This is a cylindrical piece of wood divided in the center and with a perforation around the top as well. It's hollow. Okay. I can see through it. Okay. May I turn it? May um, I attempt to turn it? Yeah, that's not going to be that's not going to help you though, but you can, but that's not a well, uh, wasn't my question. It's okay. Yeah, I can. you can turn it. Oh, that's not too annoying at all, Mike. It's a device designed to make people insane. <laughs> Physicians would use this to conduct some very important tests to learn about a patient's, please stop, general health. This is an early stethoscope. And in fact, this is a model of the earliest known stethoscope, and it's called a Lenec stethoscope, or a, Le a Lenec monaural stethoscope, because it would only be going up to one ear. You could hear the patient's heartbeat, and you could make diagnostic determinations on the health of the person's heart. Can you hear it? Can you actually do well, it? Well, let's see. Yeah, a little, little bit. Very, very, very. Are you okay? I'm good. I mean, is it weak or is it? Because it was very, it was very weak. But you know, this is an early mat. This is an early. Yeah. No, I'm. I'm sure the problem is my heart and not with your piece of rotating wood. I. I. Well, that's where my. That's where my. <laughs> I could hang out with Anna all day, not because I love looking at faces and jars, ah! but because nothing is more fun than seeing somebody who really loves their job. Oh. That's just. That's just. 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 Okay. Yeah. Please take this away from him. How do we, is there any way to get out of this segment gracefully? If you say thanks for watching, join me next week. And until next time, I'm Anna Doty. And I'm Mike Rowe. And we encourage you to think, think outside, outside the, the jar. jar. I paid attention. That was good. That was a cool man. Right, right, right? Hello, right. Emmy.